did she, at that moment, when Vera was presenting breach, did she tell you that the risk of uterine rupture after a C-section was higher during a breach birth? Could you repeat the question, please? Did she, did she tell you that the risk of uterine rupture after a C-section was higher during a breach birth? Did she have a conversation with you about that? I cannot recall. Um, did she talk about that there were, there are different kinds of breach presentations? I cannot recall. Did she tell you um, that there's... Two, no, I, I was just coming to see who was out there, but I think 2x speed is a bit high. Come here. Did you walk out here in the rain? Yeah, I had a my jacket on. Oh, did you get rain on your head? No. Can you say, hi, I'm Pex. No, we're gonna be shy now. <laughs> no. Okay, can I have a hug? Good day. Why'd you put this on today? How was your day at school? How was your day at work? It's good. My day's good. It was not good this morning, but it's good now. Complete and incomplete breach and frank breach, anything like that? Not to my knowledge. And she was only talking to you two to three minutes. Is that true? I would assume so, yes. Well, you, is that what you just said? I don't yeah. want to put words in your mouth. But yes, two to three minutes. Two to three minutes spent talking about the fact that Vera was breached. Yes. Um, did she explain to you that, that during... Um, a breach delivery when you've had a C-section prior um, that that baby needs to be delivered once it presents breach in about 30 to 60 minutes. Did she tell you that there was some urgency objection. to the delivery? I beg your pardon. There was objection. Objection, you're on the leading. Well, she asked, did she tell you this? So overall, make the answer. Could you repeat the question? Well, did she tell you that um, after C-section, when a baby starts presenting breach, that there is a sense of urgency, that, that the baby would need to be delivered within 30 minutes or maybe top 60 minutes? There was no sense of urgency. What are you looking at? After that conversation, I'm not sure what that reference was to. I, I don't know that they're like you don't have to have a breach baby delivered in 30 to 60 minutes after they've been noted to be presenting breach. It can take a while. Uh, I the point really is more that y this should be done in the <coughs> hospital. Um, and we still we do vaginal breach births at our hospital, um, but I still don't feel like I have enough training in them. I wish I had more. Just it's just less common now because of some of the data that, you know, and you need to pick the right candidate and it should be done in an environment where you can access help if you need it. But yeah, after a C-section for sure, that too. Like we, we shouldn't be V-backing outside of the hospital. In that two to three minute conversation with you and Emily, did you talk alone with Emily for a while? Yes. How long did you two talk? I would say five minutes tops. I don't need to go inside. What decision did you make about going to the hospital or staying to labor at home? The decision was that the hospital would have been another traumatic experience and that it would have caused more anxiety and more trauma to my wife and I. And we decided to stay at home and do and continue labor and delivery with Angie. Did you do that because you believed Angie could help you? Yes. Um, did you have confidence in her abilities? Yes. Did you understand in that moment how dangerous a breach birth was? No. If you understood how dangerous it was, would you have made a different decision? Yes. After that, I assume Emily continued to labor for a while? Yes. How did that go? What was happening? It, labor and delivery continued as, as such. Okay. Were you doing some of the more of the same things, making her comfortable? Yes. Was Angie Hawk making her comfortable? Yes. Was Mickey keeping her comfortable? Yes. Okay. Um, was Angie Hawk doing any maneuvers or putting her in different positions? Or Yes. Okay. What do you remember about that? What kind of things were done? Uh, the normal, uh, I, I would say the experience and maneuvers that Angie Hawk had used with Sabra to move her around were the same maneuvers that she used for Vera to move her around. And so we're clear when we're talking about maneuvers, and not everybody's given birth, <laughs> um, but it, is it just a matter of putting the woman's body in a different position? I would say that it's much more complex than that. Okay. Um, well, do you ever see Angie Hawk reaching up and trying to maneuver with her hands? or is No. It, okay, all right. Um, and what do you remember about the different positions? Uh, they were explained to Emily exactly what position she was going to be put into, how long she might be in that position for, and what the overall goal of that position may be. Was Angela Hawk making Emily comfortable, as far as you could tell? As far as I could tell, to progress labor and delivery, yes. How long would you say um, that continued? Well, at some point, did Emily get up and go to the bathroom? Yes. How long would you say um, that doing the maneuvers and continuing with making her comfortable on the in the bed there or wherever you were at. How long did that continue before Emily decided she wanted to go up into the bathroom? 45 minutes. So we're now, so, then, so about 45 minutes, is it fair to say? Well, if you had five minutes, you and Emily talked, plus the two to three, Angela Hawk talked to you about breach. We're now maybe 
52, 53 minutes into since since breach has been identified. Is that fair? I would say that's fair. Okay. So Emily went to the bathroom. Why did she go to the bathroom? She was feeling like she needed to use the restroom. Did you follow her? I followed her to the bathroom door. Yes. Okay. Did you give her privacy at that point? Yes. Did you ask her if she wanted you in there? Yes. Okay. And she told you no? Yes. Okay. Was it your impression she was actually needing to go to the bathroom, either urinate or have yes. an album or something? Is that yes? Yes. Sorry. Um, how long was she in there? She was in there no longer than 15 minutes. Okay. Where were you at when that was going on? Upstairs. Okay. Where was Mickey at? Upstairs. Where was Angie Hawk at? Upstairs. Which, which rooms were they in? We would periodically switch around. Um, again, in that time, it felt like we needed to move around a lot more, uh, but we would periodically move from hallway to bedroom to bedroom. And I probably didn't ask a very good question, but the point that Emily went into the bathroom, where were the three of you? We were all upstairs. Okay, just kind of hanging out, waiting to see what happened next? Yes. Okay. Um, where was Angie's, the defendant's kid, child? Uh, I do not exactly recall where he spent most of his time, but from my understanding, he was spent most of his time in the guest bedroom. Okay. And where, did it seem like Mickey and the defendant were taking turns going into the guest bedroom? Yes. Okay. Um, did the child get in your way at all? No. Well-behaved child was breastfeeding baby, so not not a child that was running around. Correct. All right, 15 minutes passes. What happens then? Why should I ask you this? Did, was the bathroom door locked? Do you know? Not to my knowledge. Mate. 15 minutes passed, you say, and um, so now we're into an hour and two or three minutes past when the breach has been identified. Yes. Okay. Did anybody check on Emily during that 15 minutes? Uh, I would have went to the door to ask her if she was doing okay. Did she always indicate that she was doing okay? As far to my knowledge, yes, she was doing fine. Okay. At some point, did she ask for help? Yes. How did that go? Uh, she called out for Angie, and at that point, uh, the door was open, and Angie proceeded to assist Emily as much as she could. Um, how did the door get open? Do you remember? I do not recall. Okay. Did Angie come in right away? Yes. I think what I might do is... Um, scrub forward to maybe some of the like mo more popular points in the video <laughs> or because there's two or three very many hour videos like this and I feel like we're never going to get through it. There, it's not me. There's no sound on the video. So in just a second, I think it's coming back. It is on 2x speed, but it's eight hours long and there's like three of these. <coughs> Why is this a high viewpoint? Court TV, yeah. so let's make sure we can hear you. All right, go ahead, Mr. Uh, Jameson. Mr. Renault, can you turn the stand? And just, uh, Mr. Jordan, do you want to make a motion? Yes, sir, I, I don't think there are any witnesses in the courtroom. I would just ask a motion to question all witnesses. Any objection to the motion? No, I'm not asking you to receive the call. All right, there will be receive the call for the motion uh, by Mr. Jordan is sustained. Okay. Mr. Jameson, you may proceed. Thank you, Judge. Um, Mr. Renault, we're getting to, um, <laughs> The ambulance being present. I want to back up just a second because on the break I was looking back at my notes and I forgot to ask a question. While Emily was in the bathroom for that 15 minutes, did you have any conversations with Angie Hawk about um, whether or not to go in there or what you should maybe do as it relates to her being in the bathroom? Not that I recall. Did she have? Any, did it seem she had any concern about her being in the bathroom alone? Not that I recall. All right. So let's get back to. So you said that there were paramedics and the Omaha Fire personnel were up at the top of the stairs. Um, could you hear what was going on up there? Yes. What did you hear? I heard that they were assisting Emily and Angie and Mickey as much as they could. Okay. At any time, did you hear Emily um, cry or scream out or anything like that? Yes. What did you hear? I, I do not exactly recall what I heard, but I know that there was a commotion going on upstairs. Okay. And did you hear? Did you hear a cry? I, mean, I don't want to use my. I'm not meaning to lead you along. Did you hear actual words come out of Emily's mouth? I, I could identify that Emily was in distress upstairs. And you can't identify words, but by how it sounded is what you're saying. Yes. Okay. Um, how long did it feel like to you that they were upstairs before they were <clears throat> bringing Emily down the stairs? About ten minutes. Yep. Um, did you see Emily when she came down? Yes. How did she look to you? Uh, she was uncomfortable okay. and in a state of distress. Okay. Did she say anything to you? Not that I can recall. Okay. Um, what happened next? Um, at that point, I... Uh, sorry, if somebody is asking what we're watching, it's the Angela Hawk midwife delivery trial. So we've been kind of watching this on and off through the streams. And it's a midwife in Nebraska where there are some problems with the rules and regulations surrounding home birth and midwives that leads to kind of an underground midwifery practice. And they're talking about the death of a baby that was born during a VBAC, which is vaginal birth after cesarean attempt at home with an unlicensed midwife. And the baby was also footling breach. They had told Emily that I was going to meet her at the hospital. I ran back inside, grabbed her packed bag, and hopped in my vehicle and followed the ambulance to the hospital. Did you ask if you could ride the ambulance, or was that not even an option? I do not recall if I asked or not. Okay. Um, you got in your vehicle. Did you follow the ambulance to the hospital? I was 
close behind the ambulance. Did they take off before you were able to get the bag and get to your yes. car? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, what did you? What happened when you got to the hospital? Uh, when I got to the hospital, I had entered the op operating room that my wife was in. They were at that point delivering her placenta, and uh, they were conversating with us, letting us know exactly um, how much pain she was going to feel, the process to expect, um, how long it was going to take for her placenta to be fully delivered, and uh, and, and that part of the end part of uh, labor and delivery was still continuing. Were you feeling relatively comfortable with the medical help you were getting at the hospital? Yes. Okay. Um, but still a pretty stressful situation? Yes. Okay. When you got there, were you able to see Vera when you got there? No. Okay. Did you learn whether she was still alive or not? We did not learn until after Emily had delivered her placenta. How long was that? I would say, um, I'm not too sure how long exactly it was. Um, but at some point, were you told of Vera's condition? Yes. Okay. And what did you learn about Vera's condition? That she was not going to make it, and that the hospital had put her on life support, and we were allowed to spend the weekend with her, um, hopefully to see any um, signs of life, and unfortunately there was none, and we were told to say our goodbyes on June 17th. Okay. Was Emily still admitted into the hospital by the time you said goodbye to Vera? At that point, Emily had been discharged from the hospital. Did Emily stay a day or two, though? We both stayed a day or two from June 15th to June 17th. We were at the hospital. Okay. Shoot. Sorry, I was on mute. This is so sad. Um, I, an episiotomy, someone in the chat was asking what that is. It is a cut on the perineum to um, provide more space of it for a baby to come out I don't understand and I mean this is an unlicensed midwife so maybe they also just don't understand the purpose of that but I don't understand what a episiotomy would do to help with this situation where the baby has been delivered footling breach and the head is stuck which is my understanding of what happened so if the baby is delivered out the cervix the head's the biggest part right so that's what makes delivering breech babies complicated particularly when they're footling breech because a breech baby I used to have I used to keep dolls in here I need to just get a baby doll to keep in here but a breech baby that comes out bottom first has its legs folded up so the width of the bum coming through the cervix is still smaller than the head but not as small as compared to coming out feet first, right? Because you've got the legs folded up and that's going to make the space like the baby's taking up more space in the cervix. So it can happen even with a a frank breech birth or whatever. But when the baby comes out footling breech first, the feet come out first. That means that the entirety of the baby up until the head is relatively small. So a baby can come through a cervix that's not fully dilated or maybe their head's too big to fit. You want to know that ahead of time, not at the point that the body's out, because once the body is out, the umbilical cord is also out, right? So imagine the umbilical cord is going from the navel to the placenta, and it's going through a cervix that is very tightly closed around the baby's head. It's not a strangulation issue as far as like the neck being strangled. It's a compression issue of the umbilical cord. So you're not getting enough blood flow. This is a very serious emergency and you have to manage it sometimes in a clinical setting we can do something called a dershins incision which is a cut on the cervix which if you have the cervix as the problem and you can open the cervix up sometimes that will help sometimes we would put on some forceps called piper's forceps but an episiotomy unless it's being done in order to access the cervix to help cut an incision for the baby to be able to be freed or to put on Piper's forceps, neither of which this midwife would be able to do because they aren't, midwives aren't trained in these things <laughs> in general usually, but especially not an unlicensed midwife who's probably never done this, then I don't understand the point of cutting a episiotomy, which only makes more space at the perineum, which is like the skin where crowning happens. So it doesn't really make any sense to me. I can see a situation where a episiotomy, even with trauma shears, which are not ideal, um, would make sense, but not this one. I just don't even understand. Th this just tells me more and more that this person should not have been doing this delivery. Going back to the moment that Angie Hawk identified a foot and that your child was breached, did she explain to you that there would be risk of death to Vera if you tried to deliver breach? Not that I recall. Did she explain to you there could be risk of death to Emily? Not that I recall. 
And again, the, the amount of time she spent explaining the dangers of proceeding with the breach took two to three minutes, is that right? Yes. And did that include the time she was explaining to you that she was trained in doing breaches? Yes. That is crazy to take two to three minutes to explain the pros and cons of a vaginal breach after cesarean at your house with an unlicensed midwife. That is wild. Someone asked if it would be possible to put the cord back in. So if the cord has just prolapsed and the baby is not out, then you would think that that could be possible. It's remarkably hard and not usually something that fixes anything. So what we do for just a cord prolapse where the cord has come out, but the baby is still up in the uterus is hold pressure off of the umbilical cord, which is basically like put the hand in the vagina, push the baby up so the cord's not compressed. That's how you manage a cord prolapse that's just a cord prolapse. But you can't have an umbilical cord, which is attached to the belly button. When the belly button and everything else has delivered, the cord still has to go to the placenta. Does that make sense? So there's no way to put it back in because the reason it's out is because the place it attaches is out. <laughs> because the baby's already out, you can't reach it. Back to that time, then, around. Um, she identified your being breached. What specific dangers did she tell you about? And. MTs and paramedics are trained to hold the pressure off the cord in this situation when it's just a cord prolapse, but not when it's a vaginal breach. You just, you can't do that. There's no way to hold pressure off the cord because of the reason that the cord is compressed. I do not recall any specifics except for the risks and assessments that she would cover in that time frame. So were you concerned this wasn't going to go well after Angie Hoff explained to you that she could deliver a breach? No. Did you have confidence in her? Yes. All right, I am going to show you. I believe this to be the uh, study that uh, Angie, uh, Angie Hawks held. And that, was this where you would have gone to meet with Angie Hawks, sign contracts, things of that nature? Yes. Now, you talked uh, also about times that you have group meetings with other parents. Um, would those happen in this little study or they happen elsewhere in the house? Uh, they were happening elsewhere in the house. Perhaps a living room or somewhere like that? Yes. I'd offer exhibit 65 through 68. No objection. Right, 65, 66, 67, 68 received. Just look at those a little bit. Um, you see exhibit 65? Yes. And this obviously looks like got a little couch here and a couple chairs. Yes. And 66, that just looks like we're taking an overall view of the room. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. So this is just kind of a, I don't know, standard size office. Yes, the so mother. Do you have any survived. knowledge of the maneuvers that, that Mrs. Hawk tried to perform with Nikki's assistance to try to get Vera unstuck? No. Could you... So you were downstairs when the EMTs entered the bathroom, that's right? Yes. And so you, you, you testified that you could hear Emily's voice and you registered that she was in distress, is that correct? Yes. Could you hear what anybody else was saying? No. Did any of the EMTs speak with you at any point, uh, either at your house or as they were leaving, or, or did anybody stick around to talk to you after the ambulance left? No. What happened next? I had, I had grabbed Emily's packed bag after the EMTs had left with my wife in the back of the ambulance, and I hopped in my personal vehicle and followed them to the hospital. Okay. And when did you see Emily again? When I got to the hospital. And how were you reunited? Uh, I, uh, I went through the emergency uh, emergency entrance and they had taken me to the, the operating room that she was in. And what do you remember being told? Uh, I remember being told uh, about the, the care that she was receiving at the time when they were talking through uh, talking through how her placenta was going to be delivered, uh, making her aware of how painful it was going to be. Um, they were presenting a lot of care and hospitality that was vastly different from Bellevue Medical. And do you remember any conversations um, when, you were, when you and Emily arrived at the hospital about Emily's history of trauma? Uh, not to my knowledge, no. Okay. Do you remember um, being questioned at all with, together with Emily by any of the providers at UNMC? During what time? Um, let's say during the night of the 15th into the 16th. Yes. What do you remember? I, I remember that they, uh, a lot of people had talked to us. At that point, we were already told that we were going to, that the hospital was going to monitor her for 72 hours, and there were no signs of life that we were going to have to say our goodbyes. So we were getting talked to by quite a few individuals. I did not exactly remember uh, what nurses, what doctors. Obviously, there's three shifts on nurses, so a lot of faces and names that I can't even recall or remember. Do you remember being questioned about the fact that you had started labor at home? As, uh, yes, it would have been a part of the process, I would assume. Do you remember being questioned by the police? Yes. At the hospital? Was it your impression that that was part of the process? Yes. Why? I, 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 didn't, I didn't know any better. As in, we, with, uh, with Sabra, our, when we got to the hospital, the nurses asked questions about labor starting at home, but there was no police investigation. When you transferred to the hospital with Sabra and were questioned about having started labor at home, did they ask you for the name of your midwife? If, if they did, I don't recall. Okay. Um, mm, how were you able to be with Vera during her, the hours that she was alive at UNMC? Exactly when there, we were there for two whole days. And were you able to be with her at, in the NICU? Yes. Were those hours very precious? Yes. Do you remember asking if the police interviews with you and Emily could be held off while you spent your final hours with your daughter? Yes. Was that request respected? No. 
Mr. No, was it your and Emily's intention for Vera to be born healthy and alive just like every parent that goes into a birth at UNMC? Yes. Do you believe that it was Angela Hawk's intention to support a healthy birth and a good outcome for Vera? Yes. Opinion for the court. Do you believe that it was Angela Hawk's intention to support a healthy birth and a good outcome for Vera? Yes. When the emergency developed in the bathroom and the door opened, do you believe that Angie stepped forward to do whatever she could to help Vera get born? Yes. Do you believe that there was ever a time at which anybody involved with this birth did not care about Vera or her well-being? Yes. Do you believe, I mean, let me make sure I understand my question. Was there ever a time at which anybody stopped caring about Vera during this birth? Or did everybody care about her the whole time? At what point? Was there ever a time when anybody was not caring about yes. Vera? When was that? There were several points, yes, from my wife and I's point of view that the care for Vera had stopped. Would you like to elaborate? No. Okay. Did that happen at home? It happened in the hospital. Okay. Um, but at all points, do you believe that Angela Hawk cared about your baby's well-being and was doing everything toward that end? Toward the end, toward, yes. Toward the goal of her toward her end, life. yes. Mr. No, you've testified that you and Emily were aware that there are a lot of options that, that pregnant couples face during childbirth for healthcare, is that right? Yes. And that you've testified that you were aware that pregnant couples can have their babies at home, they can have them in birth clinics with midwives, or they can have them in the hospital, isn't that right? Yes. And you're aware that in Nebraska, families choose all of those things, whether or not licensure is available for home birth midwives, yes. is that right? Um, and were you always aware that it's an option to give birth at the hospital? Yes. And so, did you or Emily need Angela Hawk to tell you that hospitals were available for options? When? Did Angela Hawk make clear to you and Emily that she would support a decision to go to a hospital if that's what your choice was? When the time came, yes. Was there ever a point at which Angela Hawk indicated that she would not support even going to the hospital if you wanted to go to the hospital? When the time came, no. Or I, I apologize, can you repeat the question? Did you ever feel like Angela Hawk prevented you from going to a hospital? No. Did you feel like she would support whatever medical choices you and Emily made, including the choice to go to the hospital at any time if you felt that was the right thing to do or what was needed? Are you referring to a specific moment or are you saying no. in general? I'm saying in general, do you believe that Angela Hawk would have supported Emily and you and your medical decisions during your home birth, including the decision to transfer to the hospital? Yes. Um, has this criminal proceeding against Angela Hawk helped you and Emily to heal from the trauma of Vera's birth? Objection. Uh, Mr. Hawk, do you believe that, An I mean, Mr. No, I beg your pardon. Mr. No, do you believe that Angela Hawk is responsible for Vera's death? Objection. No further questions, Your Honor. Any questions? Are we correct? Since Vera's death, have you educated yourself a little more on the risk of breach presentations in childbirth? Could you explain on education? Well, um, do you now know that trying to deliver Vera when she was feet first was a very dangerous situation? Objection. Irrelevant. Answer. Answer. Could you repeat the question? Well, have you learned since Vera has passed that it is dangerous to try to deliver in breach presentation the way Vera was presented? Yes. Okay. And while you say that you think Ms. Hawk had good intentions, do you think she had the knowledge Curly and curvy looks you like you have a Vera was presenting breach. potentially have a gifted opinion. sub because you have a yellow badge. Do you think you were given the correct advice from Angie Hawk to make a decision about whether to go to the hospital? I believe that she uh, foundation opinion relevance. I believe that she fulfilled what she was explaining in her contract. Would you agree that you did not? You weren't told that there was a substantial risk of rupture if, if you continued with the breach presentation. Objection has an answer. Well, it's an answer, but you may judge the world in the answer. Good afternoon, ma'am. You can set your stuff down right by the chair or whatever. And before you sit down, can you raise your right hand? Do you saw me swear firm testimony about to give the truth, hold truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay, let's see. Let me proceed. So the microphone in front of you does lift your voice a little bit, so if you maybe pull it closer to you or scoot up to it. Or, yeah, there you go. Um, please state your full name and spell both your first name and your last name for the record. Michelle, M-I-C-H-E-L. M. Hefley, H-U-E-F-T-L-E. -E. Do, do you have a nickname? I go by Mickey. How do you spell Mickey? M-I-C-K-I. -I. Okay. I'll call you Miss Hefley if that's okay, um, but is it fair to say that if there's been a witness referring to a Mickey, in this case that was probably you? I would say probably so. <laughs> okay. I don't know. You were the doula involved in this case, correct? I was. Okay. All right. Um, are you currently employed or are you retired? I'm retired. All right. Um, I want to direct your attention to, I'm, I'm specifically here to talk about um, the birth of Vera No, but I'd also like to know whether you were present for the um, laboring of Sabra No. No. Yes. Okay. I want to... Um, 
I want to take you, well, let's go back this far. Let's, do you know, know, know someone by the name of Angie Hawk? I do. How do you know Angie Hawk? I met her um, at my daughter's birth. At your daughter's birth? My, my daughter had her child with Angie Pregnant. Okay. Was Angie serving as a midwife? Yes. After you met her there, did you um, begin a relationship that included you possibly helping and becoming a doula alongside her working as a midwife? Yes. Okay. How did that relationship form? We had um, carried things out to the vehicle after that, after my daughter gave birth, and um, we're just visiting about all kinds of different things. And Angie said, have you ever considered being a doula? You're so compassionate. You're so kind. You did one. It was so neat to see you support your daughter. And yeah. I said, well, no. <laughs> but after she planted that idea, did you think that might be a good, good thing to try? Mm, I had I had previously um, been going to study, um, self-study, and my computer died, and I was not able to afford a new one, so that just kind of got set aside. Okay. Um, at some point, did you connect again, reconnect with um, Angela Hawk to serve as a doula with some of her clients? Yes. Is Angela Hawk in the courtroom today? Yes. Can you just identify for her for the record to say what she's wearing, maybe her, and, and where she's seated? She's seated at the table over there, and she is wearing... Okay, so a few questions that I want to um, address. One, what is a doula? Not a dumb question. So a doula is somebody who has training as basically a birth support person. They don't have training in... Um, hang on, let me fix this. They don't have training in like anything medical. Doulas are evidence-based uh, to have improved outcomes or improve patient satisfaction for births. And I think doulas are great, but they don't replace any kind of medical care. They're, they are a birth support person. The um, difference between, let's see, the midwife, someone in the chat, I can't see where it was, but someone had said, how long did the midwife try to deliver the baby before they actually called someone? I think that this is an important point that maybe isn't really answered by how long they tried to deliver it as far as like, as they describe coming out of the bathroom and then, you know, the baby's out to the tummy or whatever. The problem medically with the care that was provided is that they should have been able to anticipate based on what was happening that this was going to be a problem. So it wasn't really like from the moment that it was recognized that this baby was footling breach. And also there has been at the beginning some talk that there was a cord prolapse that early when the feet were out, the cord was also out. Like this is not a medical emergency immediately when the cord prolapse happens and probably even when the feet are present because this is a recognizable problem. And you would never uh, do, like, it just, it doesn't matter how long she tried to deliver the baby. Like, the problem is that it got to the point where she was even trying. Does that make sense? From first seeing a foot. But yeah, so, but before she even saw a foot, she palpated a cord. I think it was longer than that. Wearing a print glass, white, black, and gray, it looks like. Right. I guess reflect that this witness has identified the defendant. Record will sold <laughs> At some point, did you get um, meet someone by the name of names of Creighton and Emily No? Yes. When did you meet them? I don't recall for sure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Were you present for the laboring of their first daughter, Saber No? Yes. Do you think you met them before that? I am not positive. Hello. <laughs> Sometimes it picks up louder. Yes. You're not positive if you met them before? No. Uh, did you go to their residence to help with the labor of Sabra? I did. Before we get to that, I want to show you. Um, actually, you never said Mark I'm going to show you what the markings exhibit 129. Do you recognize that? I think you need to flip over through the pages to see. Yeah. Yes. What is exhibit 129? Um, the Nebraska Bird Keeper um, form that you signed to become part of the group that you can't on. jiggle a baby. I don't know how to describe it exactly. Right. Position um, once the, the, the feet are already out. out. You can turn a baby sometimes with external cephalic version, but so not at the point where your water's broken in the this feet are out. To work with her and work with um, I don't know as it was required. I think I asked because there's some training material. There's some training material. Is that what you said? Except yes. with the breach material. second. Just one. some different information on that of different events happening and stuff. Where's that training material located? I'm not even sure because if I access the site, I only access it once. Okay. I'm not good at that. Well, was it a site? Was it a website where you get this information? Objection, Your Honor. I'm not sure that the document has been received into evidence. By Rohini. Okay. Did you access the information on her website? I don't recall exactly. I, I, I don't recall exactly. If you joined, if you became a member of the association, were you able to get a password and get onto the Nebraska Birth Keepers website? Yes. Okay. Are there special things on that website that are only for people that are members? Did you know? I don't know. I'm going to ask a couple of questions about this. It looks like on the first page, you see, is that your signature? Yes. And is this the date of the 11th day of November 2017? Excuse me, my Yes. And then if I go to the back page, 
It looks like you signed again here. It's uh, November 10, 2018. Yes. Do you think you signed two different um, documents with Ms. Hawk? I really don't know. I offered exhibit one thing. Objection, Your Honor. I'm not sure how this document is relevant to the charge in this matter. Predates the events of the birth, and it's not between either of the parents and Ms. Hawk. There's no rule. One point I would say. Once you became a member and uh, agreed to work with Ms. Hawk, what was your job? Or what was your what were you set out to, setting out to do? I um, went along to act in the role of doula at births where parents had requested. Right. What is a doula? A doula provides compassionate care for parents um, while they're while they're going through the birth experience. Um, you're a, a space holder. You sometimes offer comfort, holding hands. You visit. Sometimes you fetch refreshments. Sometimes you sit quietly and wait. <laughs> a lot of waiting. A lot of waiting. What is the difference then between a doula and a midwife? Um, a doula is there particularly to provide that in that care and comfort role. Okay. Did, you, did you receive any training to be a doula? Not specific training, no. Okay. Is it kind of an on-the-job learning type thing a little bit? I think the role of a doula, either you are called to that or you're not. You have to be a caring person who's willing to spend time and be there holding that place of peacefulness for people. How many times did you serve as a doula for a birth where Angela Hawk was the midwife? I'm not certain. Okay. Was it more than a dozen? I don't believe so. Was it more than half a dozen? Possibly, yes. Were you ever paid to serve as a doula? There was a short period of time when I received um, recompense. Yes. And what were you paid? My old brain can't even remember. I'm, I believe it was $400. I want to direct your attention to the birth of Sabre and Noel. Mm -hmm. You've already said you aren't sure whether you met Creighton and Emily No prior to that day. Is that mm -hmm. right? Yes. Okay. Do you remember that day? Which day? The day that, that Emily was laboring with Sabre. Yes. Okay. Who was there? Um, when we arrived, or sure. okay. when we arrived. When we arrived um, Creighton, Emily, Angie, and I. Um, was there a photographer during that? No. That session. Okay. Did a photographer ever come that day? That no, remember? not even aware. What do you remember about that labor with Sabra? Oh, may I go back? Did you say something wrong? Yes, I did. Okay. What did you say wrong? Um, at Sabra's birth, yes, there was a third person there. And Excuse my confusion. And who was that? That was um, the birth photographer. Okay. All right. um, how long were, were you there when Emily was laboring with Sabra? I don't remember. Okay. Was Sabra ever born in their home? No. Okay. What happened that she wasn't born in the home? Um, she was not progressing the way that was expected, and um, at some point, I remember Angie saying, you should take her to the hospital, because we don't know what's going on. And so when Angie directed that, did Crane take him to the hospital? Yes. Now let's fast forward a little bit to June of 2019, um, which was when Vera No was born. Did you take part in the laboring with Emily and Creighton for Vera's birth? Yes. Had you seen Crane and Emily No between the time they had Sabra till the time <clears throat> Vera was coming? I'm not certain. Okay. Do you think you ever saw them at Angie Hawk's house? I believe I did once. How was it that you got invited to take part in Vera's birth? I actually requested, and then later found out that I had been invited to go. Why did you request it? I felt a very special connection to Creighton and Emily. You like them? Yes, I do. Okay. Right. Um, what do you remember about going to their house uh, for Vera's labor? Hmm. I lose track of time because I enter a spot that is there. Um, we arrived and went in, and they were laboring upstairs. Okay. Was anyone else home? I don't know. Okay. Um, would you remember seeing Sabre that day? No. Okay. Um, how did things go with labor in the beginning? Let's talk about just that. Did you get there in the morning, do you think? I don't have any idea. Okay. In the beginning, how were things going as far as the labor was concerned? Um, very quiet and very calm. Okay. Um, were you giving some aid to Emily? We greeted and went in, and I don't know exactly how it all went. I'm sure I sat alone and okay. probably wouldn't sat on the floor. At some point, did you and Angela Hawk leave? We did leave for lunch. Okay. Where did you go for lunch? To a little deli on close to 72nd Street in Omaha. Did you go elsewhere? Did you go shopping? Did you stop anywhere? We went more for a, because our lunch was not long, we went more for a stretch our legs kind of thing and to give the nose their privacy. Okay. How long do you think you were gone? I don't know. Okay. How were things going when you re eventually returned to the residence, is that right? Yes. What did you observe when you got back there? Emily was still laboring. What do you call happening next? I, I apologize, I don't know for sure what order and sequence things went in exactly. Let me ask you this. At some point, did Angela Hawk do a check on Emily to see how she was doing? I believe so. Okay. And what did she discover? She said there are, there's possibly an umbilical cord. Okay. Did she say umbilical cord or just cord? I don't recall. Okay. And that was when she was doing the vaginal check with Emily? I believe so. Okay. Um, did she identify that she felt horrifying. anything else? A bit later on, she said, oh, toes. Oh, toes? Yes. Okay. So she didn't say foot or feet, she said toes. Yes. Okay. What happened after that? Okay, so <laughs> this is horrifying. They left a vaginal breach.
patient who had had a vaginal delivery before, no, who had had a C-section before, sorry, at home laboring in active labor with a breech, footling breech baby after her water had broken. Um, excuse me. <laughs> what are you doing? That is so stupid. Um, yeah, the question about did she say umbilical cord was kind of weird. Like, of course, it's an umbilical cord, but I don't know what she said. Um, yeah, all of this is horrifying. I, this, yeah, we want to know how long from the, hmm, a cord, uh, toes, how adorable. Like, that should have been the moment an ambulance was called. The baby already might have not been able to survive. It could have already been compromised, depending how long that cord had been out. But the moment they said, ah, a cord, hmm, toes. Yes, uh, hello, 911. Yes, uh, I have an emergency on my hands. We have a cord prolapse and a vaginal breach patient <laughs> who's also had a prior C-section. And uh, I just wanted to let you know that we're planning on doing this birth at home just wanted to you know make sure you think that's good or not and the emts would have been like i'm sorry what no we'll be right there this is a medical emergency ah it's so crazy she like i know they really didn't want to go to the hospital but because they had delivered with her in the past i i think they would have said yes to going to the hospital if she told them that she thought that they should and there is no excuse for why this would not be the point where she said that they should. There's no excuse. You're you're liable. And I it's like there's no excuse for that. I believe <clears throat> excuse me. I believe that um, I would step out into the other room and Angie and the nose had a visit or I'm not. Did you overhear any of that conversation? No, not really. How long do you think that lasted? I don't know. Okay. What happened after Angela Hawk had a visit with Emily Creighton? Um, at some point, I had stepped across the hall and come back and um, sat down beside the bed. Beside the bed where Emily was? Yes. And what were you doing? Just holding space. Okay. Were you talking to her? Reassurances, yeah. Okay. Did you overhear any discussion about going to the hospital at that time? No. Were you holding her hand? Yes, I did. Was Creighton No still there? I don't know for sure. He came and went. How long did that go on? I don't recall. Do you recall whether um, Angela Hawk was putting Emily or, or co coaching her into different positions? No, not at that point. Right. What do you remember happening next of significance? Um, someplace along the line, um, Emily stated that she needed to get to the restroom. All right, how much time do you think passed from the time that She's identifying possibly a cord and then said, oh, toes, passed between then and when Emily said she wanted to go to the restroom. I'm not certain. Okay. <laughs> do you think it was pretty immediate or do you think some time passed? Some time passed. Okay. So when she went to the restroom, did you follow at all? I did. Okay. Did anybody else follow? Not that I recall. Okay. <clears throat> and what happened when she went into the bathroom? I said, would you like me to come in with you? And she said, no. Okay. Did you shut the door? Yes. Okay. Where did you go? I went into the spare bedroom. Okay. How many beds were in the spare bedroom? Two. Okay. Was anybody else in that spare bedroom with you? At some point, Angie was. I don't know if she was there when I went in or if she was there later. Did you bring any, I know with laboring can last a long time, did you bring an overnight bag or uh, items in case you're there for over 24 hours, 36 hours, things like that? I bring a carry in bag with my snacks and water because I drink copious amounts of water. And um, I had crocheting and a book and those sort of things. Um, I showed you these yesterday, do you recall? Yes. All right, so I'm showing you exhibit 24, and then I'm going to show you. 25, and you see, they were seeing the set of bed here. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then I'm going to 26. Is that the spare bedroom where you were um, at when Emily was in the bathroom? Yes. At some point, well, did you, did you fall asleep? Did you take a nap? What happened during that time? I may have fallen asleep for a few moments. I lay down to stretch out. Did something wake you up or alert you? I heard Emily call. Okay. What'd she call? Angie. Okay. Was Angie with you at the time? She was in the room, yes. Okay. And what did you do? I sat up on the bed and... Um, I think that's killing. Who's killing him? Angie's um, child. Okay. So by taking him, you think that Angie must have been there with him? Yes. Okay. Did did Angela Hawk, do you know if Angela Hawk heard Emily call out? I don't know for sure. Did you say anything to Angela Hawk? I said yes, she's calling. Okay. And what happened next? Angie went to the doorway okay. of, the bath, of the bathroom. Could you see that from where you were at or yes. did you get up and follow? Okay. What happened when she got to the doorway? 
I believe she asked if it was okay if she came in. And then what happened? I believe she said, I'm gonna need help. And what did you do? Some place in there, Creighton was there, and I looked at him and I said, are you going to go help? And he said, you'll be better help than I will. And so he took the baby and I went to the doorway of the bathroom. What did you observe when you got to the doorway? Emily was um, leaning over the edge of the bathroom. What did you observe as far as whether, how far along she was in to give you her? Um, Vera was born to the waist, I believe. Born to the waist? Yes. That is very, very scary. Just horrifically scary. Um, the fact that the dad said, you'll be more help than I am, is, I, in my opinion, one more level of evidence that he has not been appropriately informed on either the risk, what could happen, what is currently happening, or the appropriate training level to deal with what is happening. Because a doula has zero medical training. They are really great. I think doulas are great. Don't get me wrong. Just this isn't their job. And she will not be any more help than the husband, unless he just means in order to stay calm. But I assume that he probably also is just not clear on everybody's level of expertise or role. What do you mean by that? She was born to the waist. So um, were her legs coming out first or just her, her legs? Okay, all right. So you could basically see from the waist down. The yes. Showing you what's been marked as exhibit nine, and then I'll also show you exhibit 10. Do you recognize that bathroom? Yes. Home birth can be safe that when that the right the candidates and the appropriate training and the correct the system bathroom? is set into place. So it's the U.S. has so it's as wide as the a bathtub is all, correct? poor There's setup no for making home birth safer. safer. And so, um, how did you see Emily? She was leaning over the edge of the tub on her knees with like her elbows up on the edge of the tub. So her knees were on the ground? Yes. And elbows up on the tub? Yes. So you were observing the backside of her? Well, I was looking at her from that angle. I don't know if I saw her immediately or if Angie was. Yes, I would have been observing her from that. All right, so uh, what did you do now? Um, I believe Angie said, we need to have you stand up. And Emily said, I can't. And so I stepped around and through and into the bathroom. At some point you called 911, is that right? The call was dialed from my telephone, yes. Okay, <coughs> is that before this or after that? I want to make sure we're saying this in order. I honestly don't know. Those events are rapid fire. Okay, so let's get to the 911 call. Did you dial 911 on your phone? I did. Did you talk to the 911 operator? No. What did you do? I handed my phone to Creighton and said, Angie wants us to call 911. I don't know your address. <clears throat> Excuse me. Can I you avail water? myself to a glass oh, yeah, of water? water? Thank you. Sorry, I should have offered earlier. It's all good. <coughs> so you handed the phone to Creighton because you did not know his address. Is that what you're saying? Yes, basically. All right. Um, and you don't know exactly when that 911 call happened. That red guy. What are we, what, tell me your questions. I can explain what's happening. How can people know who is a good midwife? Is there like an agency? Yeah, that's the thing is that that's really hard in the U.S. because of the way that licensing happens in, in the U.S. In some states, you don't have to have any formal training to call yourself a midwife. So it leaves the honest. I mean, there are separate categorizations. So people who are nurse midwives or certified midwives will put that in the information and they'll talk about it. But unless someone is well-versed in what the difference between a lay midwife or a traditional midwife or a certified midwife or a certified professional midwife or a certified nurse midwife is, then they're not going to be able to delineate which of those is actually well-trained and safe to care for them. So there's not an easy way. It's because of the system that we have in the U.S. where in some places there's all these midwife types that exist that all just call themselves midwives. Because if you see someone that's a nurse midwife, and you don't know about all these different designations of midwife, then yeah, you will see that they've put certified nurse midwife and they'll talk about why that's important. But if you just happen to get in with somebody who is a traditional midwife, then if you don't know all these crazy systems exist, you don't even know to ask. So you're leaving, it's dangerous because you don't know the level of expertise or of somebody who's attending your birth. As opposed to if you just sh have a baby with an obstetrician or there's a nurse around, usually that's a, a very laid out and specific training path that you have to go to and level of expertise that you have to not only achieve but also maintain over time, which doesn't exist for some of these levels of, uh, of home birth. 
or not of home birth, I'm sorry, of midwife. Um, I see an interesting conversation here. Hang on just a second. Um, it's not victim blaming. It's accepting that we have a personal responsibility for our own health care decisions. Yeah, I think, well, to be fair, Sarah, with stars, I mean, you have a point. We have to make these decisions and take onus, ownership of them. Uh, this family is not who's suing the midwife. The state is doing that because of the outcome being so egregious. The family doesn't want to to participate in this, I don't think. I think they have been sanctioned and required to. Um, but I don't necessarily agree. I don't I agree we have to take ownership over our decisions, but there is very clear medical malpractice, but really you can't even say that because this person doesn't have a license. So practicing medicine without a license, definitely happening here. And they were not upfront about their actual level of expertise with handling this problem. And they made the decision not to send this person to the hospital when it's very clear to anyone with any experience that that was the point. Ah, feet, ah, umbilical cord. I mean, even ignoring the fact that this should have never been okay, like, yeah, we'll do a home birth. Like, even if you want to ignore that, that was the point where an emergency, like, it was happening and they should have been sent to the we, we should have been calling 911 at that point. So there's just so many points in this that like not enough con information was given to the parents regarding this diagnosis, what it could mean in the process of the labor when you've diagnosed that it's footling breach and there's a cord, n no discussion about what that could mean. There's many points in this where I think you lose the ability to say that this family made an informed choice. They didn't. They were misled. No. But are you pretty clear that Angie said call 911? Either call 911 or I, I believe she said call 911. Okay. So let's get back into the bathroom here. You said you stepped in the bathtub? Yes. Okay. And what were you doing? I was assisting Emily. How were you assisting her? Um, I squatted down because she had stated that she couldn't stand herself. And I squatted down in front of her and looked her in the eyes and said, put your arms around my neck, on my shoulders, and I will wrap my arms around you if that's okay. And then we will stand. Together. Yes, Swifty. We would not have uh, recommended much, but we this here, so patient. So how much I'd like you to tell us what your height is and how much you weighed at that time. No one will repeat it. I'm not sure. I don't care. No, I'm not sure. My height is five, four, five, six, something like that. You shrink with age. And my weight was probably 150, 155. Um, that's not a, that large a person, but were you able to lift Emily or was it kind of a joint effort where both of you were doing it together? It was a joint effort. I never lifted Emily. Okay, all right. So when she got stand, stood up, what happened next? Um, Angie requested that she move to different positions, and so I assisted her with those. Did all that take place in that bathroom? Um, at some point, we moved to the hallway. Why did you move to the hallway? More room. Okay. What happened when she got to the hallway? Um... Right. I think so. Song of Summer says, I do believe that their OB gave them that advice. And due to their medical trauma, they decided to have a home birth anyways. Yes. Yes. Like that is the point where it's like, yeah, take ownership. You decided to do this. A uterine rupture. I feel like I would say that because they've talked to somebody who gave them the information about this. Right. But this is not the same. The problem here is the footling breach and cord prolapse. They did not have the information on this that they needed to make a decision. Down either on all fours or I believe she got down on all fours. When you're in the hallway, yeah. were you pretty much right at the top of the stairs? Is that where both of you got in way too? Yes, but closer to the edge of the, to the, on the master bedroom side. Got some pictures of that too, mm -hmm. so let's see if we have some of those. So six, of course, is the stairs going up. You see that? Yes. Okay. And seven, it's maybe a better view. And you go up the stairs, what, what's to the right? Is that the, to the right is the guest bedroom. So your side of the bathroom door. If you remember. I. Angie was there with Killian, and I was in there, and I, I may have fallen asleep for a few minutes. Okay. Um, Hello. And so, recent while Emily was in the bathroom, which you describe yourself, thank you for joining us, talk as waiting either for Emily to come out of the bathroom or for her to let you know if she needed assistance in there. Yes. Is it normal for women in labor to go into the bathroom during labor? Yes. Does it, does it happen commonly that they will go into the bathroom? Yes. And sometimes for a long, longer period of time than people usually use for bathroom visits while they're in labor. Yeah, but if you already know that this patient has a prolapsed cord and a footling breech baby. And now they feel like they have to have a bowel movement. Come on. You only have to be a midwife for five minutes to know what's wrong with that.
labor? Yes, because it allows a woman to sit in a position that you don't get into any other place. Okay. Is it helpful for women going through the process of a physiological labor to have privacy, uh, meaning to have some space to labor in private? Yes. Is that something that uh, a doula or a midwife uh, is sensitive to in supporting a woman through a physiological labor? Yes. And is it sometimes the case if a woman is in early labor and she's having the kinds of contractions that are opening up her cervix for a, a midwife and a doula to leave her alone and give her space to go through that process with some privacy? Yes. Camo doll. They did know. Would you that describe the Emily Noah as a private person in your experience of her? Definitely so, yes. And, and why would you say definitely so? How could you tell that privacy was important to Emily? Having been with them through the first birth, she had stated the fact that she liked her privacy and that, you know, we visited about mundane things. But this is referring to when Sarah was born. Um, and I became aware during that, that birth that she, they are very, um, she's a very private person. And did she communicate her need for privacy during that birth because she was asking for her privacy to be supported and respected in caring for her throughout childbirth? Yes. When Emily was in the bathroom, did you hear any sounds coming out of the bathroom? I did not. In your experience with childbirth, do women usually make sounds when they are pushing a baby out? It depends on the particular woman. Would you say more often than not they make sounds when they're pushing a baby out? My observation does not, not support that idea, no. Okay. Um, Yeah, so CNM and CM are both high-level degrees. CM is a direct entry midwife, meaning they don't have a um, like nursing degree first. CNM has a nursing degree first, but both CM and CNM are typically very well trained uh, in higher-level degrees. CM, I mean CPM, Certified Professional Midwife, is basically like yeah, so someone in the chat, I can't see the name anymore, has said like certain number of hours assisting in observing labor and birth and pass an exam. Um, but they also can be a safe provider. Traditional midwives just completely have a like apprenticeship type training, also sometimes called lay midwives. Um, the differentiation, deciding what the difference is between those is hard because you don't have like the level of understanding necessary for the most part as a, you know, regular person out in the world to know what the difference is. So like I was saying earlier, you're not like if you see one of the good ones, then you'll see like, oh, yeah, I'm NARM uh my training is NARM approved you know I have like the approval level of midwives around the world or whatever but the people who aren't are not going to say oh yeah I'm not that right they're they're going to leave that out and if you don't know all of this you don't even know that that's a problem so the reason it's a problem is because ha people don't have any way of knowing Was the first that you heard from inside the bathroom after you parted with Emily at the door and she went into the bathroom, was the next sound that you heard Emily calling for Angie? Yes. Do you have any recollection of how you, Creighton, and Mrs. Hawk arrived at the bathroom door or went through it, who got there first, were you all crowded into it, or what that moment was like? Could you restate that question? I'm sorry. Do you have any recollection of, of what happened after Emily called out for Angie? Would you describe yourself, Creighton, and Mrs. Hawk as immediately responsive to, to Emily's call? Yes. Did you all move toward the bathroom door to support Emily? Yes. Angela was first. Angela was first. Mm -hmm. Was Angela already in the bathroom by the time you got to the bathroom door, if you remember? Yes. And so why did you enter the bathroom? Because Angela said, I'm going to need help. And did you know at that time what that help was going to require? No. Um, and what do you remember about what happened next? What was the first was the first kind of help that she asked for help to lift her to standing, as you described in, in your previous testimony? Yes. And, and uh, how did you know how to safely lift another grown-up, a pregnant grown-up? I had worked in a nursing home. My father was very stringent about never lift with your back, always squat and lift with your legs, and just instinctively did that, I guess. And what was Angie doing while you were helping to, um, helping Emily to shift into different positions? I don't know. Was she, she was present, but I was focusing on Emily and helping. Could you tell? Okay, so the... CM and CM. So CPM can be very well trained and meet international standards of midwifery care, but not always. So it's dependent upon where they trained, what their level of training was. It's like, there's no way to be sure. I hope that makes sense. Like, 
I mean, they'll tell you if they are, if they meet the national and international midwifery training levels. The problem isn't really that you all, like, wouldn't be able to figure it out, right? Now you've been here, like, you'd be able to decipher through, like, is this person have enough training that I feel comfortable with them just just delivering my baby? It's not that that wouldn't be possible for you. It's that most people don't have this conversation prior to coming into that decision. Whether um, Angela remained calm during the emergency or if she was panicking, she was calm. Um, and do you recall, was there a time when you remember Angela instructing Emily to lie on her back and try that position? Yes. During the times that you were helping Emily to shift into these different positions, could you see Angela working between Emily's legs at all to try to reach in and help free Vera's head from Emily's pelvic bones? I could not tell for certain what she was doing, but she was in a position that was between Emily's legs, yes. Could you see what, whether her hands, could you see where her hands were touching from where you were? No. I was at Emily's head, relaying the physical instructions to move. Was Emily doing all that she could to cooperate with Angela and try to birth her baby safely? Yes. And what do you remember happening when the EMTs arrived? It was, um, they brought with them a form of, oops, excuse me, their own, I mean, they, I stepped back a bit from Emily when they, because they come up and they are there present. We, during your testimony today, you reviewed a picture of the bathroom. It looked pretty small. Did all four EMTs squeeze into that bathroom? We were in the hallway by then. Okay. When had you moved to the hallway? When Angie requested her to lay down, I believe. So then, therefore, was there a moment before the EMTs arrived on the scene when you and Angie were helping Emily out of the bathroom so that she could have more room in the hallway? Yes. Okay. So by the time the EMTs came upstairs, you and Emily and Angie had left the bathroom and were now in the hallway? Yes. When the EMTs arrived in the hallway, was it your observation that they were acting ready and prepared to take Emily to the hospital when they walked into the, into the hallway? A lay midwife is a traditional midwife. These people don't have any formal training and, in my opinion, are not somebody who should ever be used for a home birth. I think that is not okay. My impression is that they stood and observed what was going on. Did you have the impression that, did you hear them make, say, make any instructions or questions to Mrs. Hawk? At some point, I believe somebody said something about an episiotomy. Did you have the impression that the EMTs wanted Mrs. Hawk to get the baby out before they took anybody to the hospital? Yes, at that point. And were they looking to her to be the person who could get that baby out? Objective speculation. In, in your observation, did it seem as if the EMTs were looking to Mrs. Hawk to be the person who would get the baby out? Yes. Well, of course. Of course they were. They didn't... The EMTs walked into the situation. They don't have extensive training in delivering breech babies or any babies. They have some training in how to handle an emergency, but... Uh, that's... Of course they did. That's what they should have done. Because they think this is a properly trained midwife if anybody here is going to be able to get this baby out it's going to be the midwife come on that doesn't that's not like speaking to the defense of this midwife have you ever seen mrs hawk perform an episiotomy at a birth prior to this no had you ever even heard her talk about performing an episiotomy at a no. birth was it your impression that everything that mrs hawk was doing at that time was responsive to the emergency in front of you and trying to save your and emily yes did you hear anybody offer mrs hawk a scalpel for the episiotomy, for an episiotomy? I did not. Um. Uh, because uh, we don't do episiotomies with scalpels. It sounds like a really good way to scalpel a baby's head or in this situation, you know, whatever part of the baby was at, at the perineum. You do, you do that with scissors. When, what caused the EMTs to finally leave for the hospital with Emily and the baby? Angie had said, you need to transport her now. And did she say that after she was unable to, after continuing to try to get the baby unstuck and was unable to do so? And the baby still did not come out? Yes. She should have said, you need to get this woman to the hospital an hour and a half to six hours ago. In your experience working with Creighton and Emily No, did you have the impression that they loved and cared about their babies even before they were born? Yes. Was it your experience that they were at any time neglectful or unconcerned with the well-being of Vera or Sabra? Absolutely not. Is it your experience is that Angela Hawk does her very best in every situation to help facilitate a safe and healthy birth for the couple she assists? Yes. Objection. <laughs> Objection, Your Honor. This is irrelevant. And also, I, as a doula, do not have the expertise to say whether or not the midwife has done everything in their power to keep the patient safe. Objection, Your Honor. She can't answer that question. 
And was it your impression of the birth of Vera? No, no, that Angela Hawk tried very hard to help Vera to be born safe and alive. Objection. Could you restate the question? Was it your impression during the birth of Vera? No, or during your time with, the, with around the birth of Vera? No, that Angela Hawk tried very hard and did her best to help Vera to be born safe and alive. Yes. No further questions, Your Honor. Did you hear Angela Hawk explain in detail the dangers of trying to deliver a breech baby after cesarean? Objection. No, I asked and answered. She testified that she was not present for any such conversation. Just saying. Any other? You just talked about how Angela Hawk did everything she could to help. How long into a typical delivery would a trained professional notice a baby's fiddling breach? Uh, I would know before the patient was in labor, if I had been taking care of them the whole pregnancy, hopefully. And if I didn't, as soon as the cervix was dilated enough to feel the presenting part, I should know, for footling breach. Perhaps earlier than that, depending on where I'm identifying the heart rate and things like that, but help Vera during doing everything she could to help Vera did you ever hear her tell Emily and Creighton that having a breach birth after cesarean is very dangerous objection your honor has answered may I answer another one objection could you restate the question please did you in, during this time of her doing everything Angela Hawk doing everything she could to help Vera did you ever hear her tell Emily and Creighton know about the dangers of giving a breach birth after cesarean I have not party to any of those conversations you were testifying on cross-examination that Creighton and Emily know were very good with their children taking care and you think they were just good parents is that fair to say yes okay. and in that do you think that they would to make sure things went well with that birth, do you think they would have done whatever Angie Hawk told them to do? Objection, Your Honor. If somebody presented to the hospital and we didn't know anything about them, the first exam you do, where you do a cervical check, would tell you that a baby was breech or footling breech. Now, it can be hard to identify that. I don't think I have ever missed a breach on exam, but it can happen. It's not malpractice if that happens, but that didn't happen here. I mean, they knew this baby was breached from before labor. Calls for speculation. Same. Were they receptive to direction that Angie, Angie Hawk was giving them? Objection, Your Honor. Asked and answered because she testified that she did not observe Angie Hawk giving them directions or giving information and consent. Answer. Were they receptive to the things Angie Hawk would tell them to do? My only specific instance with that would be when we were in the hallway or in the bathroom, Emily and I, and Emily was very responsive, moving the way Angie communicated and I re-communicated to her. Well, Angie Hawk said call 911. Everybody was receptive to write that, correct? You called and then... I called. Okay. And Creighton was willing to talk to 911. Is that true? Yes. Likewise, when Angie Hawk, during Saber's birth, said you should take her to the hospital, that's what Creighton did when Angie said that. Is that right? Um, not immediately. He, um, at that time, it, I heard Angie talk to them about, um, we did not know what was going on there. It was, it was, excuse me just a moment. <laughs> There, Emily was not showing progress. She was not feeling the urge to push or anything like that. And at that point, I, Angie said, you should take her to the hospital probably because we're not seeing the progress that we need to. And in that instance, that's what Creighton did, took Emily to the hospital, right? He and Emily visited, I believe, and they decided to do that, yes. When the EMTs got there, was um, you said the EMTs were looking at Angela to do things. Was Angela kind of running the show at that point? They did not react in the way I expected them or thought that they probably would as emergency medical people who had been called to attend a situation. Had you had never been in a situation like that before, isn't that true? True of birth, no. And Angela Hawk, did you hear her identify herself to them um, and say why she was there or anything like that? I, not Objection, that I Your Honor, outside the scope of cross-examination. I was very focused on Emily and being not in the way of them doing, the paramedics doing what they needed to do. Yes, sir. No other questions, Judge. Thank you, Your Honor. Am I... Sorry, guys. I'm an idiot. Um, a couple of things to address in the chat. So, I feel terrible for this mom and family, but I'm still extremely confused and even a little upset that she chose to have a home birth with a breech baby. Yeah, I think that, I think that in discussing that, we need to first, how good was the information she had regarding the risk of that? And second, she has a lot of hospital trauma, right? So sometimes people make that decision based on really bad experiences. And while it's not the choice that I would make, I believe in people's ability to make the choices that they think are best for themselves, assuming appropriate counseling has gone into that regarding the risk and the 
very clear recommendation of whoever their healthcare provider is has been well documented. I, I there's a lot of there's a lot of reasons that people don't want to have babies in hospitals and you know there's a lot of things at play in this okay so it wasn't just this midwife I don't think she's solely at like liable here I think the laws in Nebraska that make people unable to have a licensed midwife at their delivery are a problem. I think the way that this person has interacted with the health system in the past, which was likely facilitated by the midwife and the contentious relationship that results in a midwife bringing their completely dilated patient to the hospital who's been pushing for a long time. The fact that there's not good integration of the hospital system in the US where midwives can't just come in and yeah, no, I'm not blaming anyone. I get it. I know you all are like compassionate and wonderful. Don't, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm just honestly, I'm just working through some of my thoughts and feelings too, because I think these are really um, normal feelings. I, I get it. I feel it. Yes, I get it. I, yes. Um, I'm not reprimanding anyone. The way that the hospital system interacts with midwives, especially home birth midwives, creates problems there. The way patients who've chosen midwife or hospital, I mean, out of hospital birth are treated by the medical team when they come to the hospital is a problem. So this is so like many, 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 many layers of what has happened here. That being said, the direct cause of them not going to the hospital earlier because they clearly were okay to go at some point when the recommendation from the midwife was strong enough the problem is that recommendation not being strong enough at a point where it should have been and would have saved probably the life of this baby. Is everybody with the next witness? It's Paul Officer, uh, Oklahoma Fire Department Officer, Firefighter Brian Strasis. Go ahead. Yes. Yes, Leopold can help you decide if a baby's breach. It's it can be difficult sometimes, and it's not a hundred percent, but it can. Yes, I do. Um, from the other night. Yes. And it was a normal birth. Directions are giving information and consent. Were they receptive to the things Andrew Hawk would tell them to do? Did you hear them make, say, make any instructions or questions to Mrs. Hawk? Breach birth after cesarean is very dangerous. Objection, Your Honor. It's answered. Should we take the question? Was it your impression during the birth of Vera Noah, during your time with, the, with around the birth of Vera Noah, that Angela Hawk tried very hard and did her best to help Vera to be born safe and alive? Yes. No further questions, Your Honor. Did you hear Angela Hawk explain in detail Objection. the dangers her opinion of is irrelevant. trying to deliver a baby after cesarean? Objection, Your Honor. Asked and answered. She testified that she was not present for any such conversation. Just saying. You just talked about how Angela Hawk did everything she could to help Vera. During doing everything she could to help Vera, did you ever hear her tell Emily and Creighton that having a breach birth after cesarean is very dangerous? Objection, Your Honor. It's answered. May I answer that one Could you repeat the question, please? Did you, in, during this time of her doing everything, Angela Hawk doing everything she could to help Vera, did you ever hear her tell Emily and Creighton know about the dangers of giving a breach birth after cesarean? I am not party to any of those conversations. So no, the answer is no. You were testifying across. What my lecture? Thank you. Good afternoon. And before you sit down, can you raise your right hand? You saw us through our testimony you're about to give with truth, whole truth, nothing but truth. Say that for shit. I want to show you all the chat. Court TV, when they live streamed this, had a chat going as well. And I think it's like really telling because they all get it too. Um, so the midwife wanted to have the assistance of EMTs and they just looked at the midwife like, do something. Yeah, of course. Um, firefighters came, uh, when she said, I feel to toast, time to get to the hospital immediately. Yep. You don't have to be very intelligent in the, not like she's dumb, but like in the way of birth. Could you please state the record? This was um, Ryan, Strauss, S-D-R-A-Z-D-A-S. How are you employed? How are you, how are you employed? Oh, through the city of Omaha Firefighter. How long have you been still employed? Um, 20 plus years. So what is your role um, currently with the Omaha Fire Department? Um, firefighter on a uh, engine. 
And do you recall, uh, do you respond to calls for emergency service? Yes. And when those, do you have any specific training to allow you to respond to those calls? Uh, we have our EMTs, EMT basic okay. through the state. And you possess the EMT basic certification? Yes. What training, um, or how long was that training? Um, it was three month class, and then you had to do 120 some hours of write time, and then a certain amount of skills. So write time and skills, what does that mean? Um, writing in an ambulance, having patient contact. And during those three months of training, um, how much training do you have on labor and delivery issues? Um, it, was a whole, it was a chapter, um, I'd say two, three days. Two, three days? For pediatric stuff, yes. Um, during that training, um, to fulfill your role as an EMT, were you given any specific training regarding uh, emergencies regarding breach births? Yes. What was that training? Um, two to three days for pediatric stuff. Well, it's not even pediatric. And also, they are not an M EMT. They're a fire firefighter, so that's interesting. No, they're not always, that's not an overlap that... Mm -mm. Mostly for basic, it was load them and try to get to the hospital as soon as possible. Okay. Um, did you receive any training on times when you've not just load up and go to the hospital? Um, if birth was imminent and it was a normal birth. Um, and if it was a normal birth and birth is imminent, then what would you do? Um, we, we were taught or trained how to assist the delivery head first, hold baby, suction, um, cut the cord, oxygen. Okay. And what is it? What is your training on what an imminent birth is? Um, if the head is showing, if it's crowning. Only the head? Yes. Um, we received any training on how to respond if any other parts of the baby are showing during delivery besides uh, the head? Yes. Try to take the pressure off of mom by raising the hips and trying to get to the hospital as soon as possible. Okay. Um, as part of your job as an EMP with Omaha Fire, um, do you guys have any standard record keeping procedures? Uh, we have to fill out a report. The captain of the engine or the responding truck and ambulance have to fill out the reports and the narrative at the end of it every run, yes. I'm going to ask you to pull the microphone a little closer because you're <laughs> right, a little soft-spoken. Um, as part of that report, um, is it all manually entered or is some of that computer generated? Um, some of it's computer generated at the times. Uh, there's some stuff entered by dispatch. Okay. So some of that comes pre-populated based on the nature of the call, is that fair to say? Yes. Were you on duty on June 15th of 2019? Yes. What station were you assigned to? Uh, 41 off of 61st names. 61st names? Yes. Um, in the evening hours on that shift, did you receive a call for service regarding a labor and delivery issue? Yes. Do you recall what time that came in? Uh, I was, believe it was around 9 o'clock, 9.20, somewhere around there. Would the exact time be listed on a report? It would. Um, may I call witness? Um, did you read a report um, with that professional recollection as the times of a specific call? Yes. Can I ask you to look at this three-page document? Do you recognize what that is? Um, yes, this is the patient care report. Uh, for a call on June 15th, 2018? Yes. Does it list times that you were called for service? Uh, it does. And if you, if you could take a look to review that document regarding the time specifically, yes. we'll look up when you're ready to answer questions. Have you reviewed that document? I have. Is there a question recollection as to the time you were dispatched for? Yes, it does. What time did you get dispatched for? 926, 21. That's supposed to be in the military time, correct? Yes. So approximately 926 you received a call. Um, what time, what time did you arrive uh, for that? Well, 926 you were dispatched. That means the 911 call came in? Yes. And same time you were dispatched to go out? Yes. What time did you uh, indicate that you were en route to the scene? Um, we have to be out of the station in under a minute. And were you? Yes. What's your role? Um, specifically that night for that call? Um, just assist with the paramedics and what they need. Uh, are you writing in front, writing, writing in back? I'm writing in back okay. on the end of the call. And then um, do you recall what time you arrived at the scene that you were dispatched to? It was approximately four minutes. Okay. And where precisely were you dispatched to? Um, 46 in Spalding. Okay. Is the exact address listed on your report? It is. Okay. You can review your report and you're ready to answer questions. Yes. So, yes, it looks like 4826 falling. And is that located in Douglas County? Yes. Approximately how far away is that from the station level? I would say approximately three or four miles. And I'm going to show you what's been received as exhibit number one. Do you recognize uh, the residents depicted in exhibit number one? Yes, I do. How do you recognize it? Um, from being there that night. That's the uh, address that you were dispatched Yes. And what was the type of uh, address, or what type of call were you dispatched for? It was a uh, uh, maternity. What does that mean? Um, means that somebody, a mom, pregnant mother is having problems. And when you arrived at that location, where did you go? Uh, we went in the front door. And then where? Uh, upstairs. Um, I saw mom kneeling down um, with the uh, baby out, the, all the way down, shoulders, down to the toes with the head still in her. Can you show you what's marked in exhibit number six? Do you recognize what's in exhibit number six? I do. What do Those are the stairs that we went up where mom was at the top of the landing. Can you show you exhibit number eight? Do you recognize what's in exhibit number eight? Uh, yes, that's the, the landing where mom and um, Miss Hawk were. <laughs> My uh, seven-year-old just came out here like, he acting like Tarzan, like beating his chest and acting wild. Um, yes, this is interesting. Sad, but interesting it is. Um, I have... I have been informed that... You're sitting by me. Okay, great. I'll be right there. 